Um, you get to suffer me again. We want to talk about the binary distribution prototype um, progress and plans, which Philip was talking about as part of the five-year planning and then the sovereign fund work. Um, I won't introduce myself again. So what I was going to cover in this one is a little level set on sort of the history of binary artifacts, what we call binary artifacts in the Octa Project uh, open embedded world, um, and then sort of talk a few about the things that are produced, um, highlight actually you know the plumbing and the infrastructure and how that relates to ease of use. And there's more benefits than just having some binary packages around the goal would be to make an easier on-ramp uh, to the Octa project for, say, hobbyists or somebody who needs to try out a board, get something booting, and then, then we can get them into the project like that. Um, so there, are, there is other sort of social mind share, long-term project advantages to having something like this available. And then I'm going to do an update on the current um, efforts on the prototype which we will have something by the agreement, which I'll get into by uh, the April time frame, something will exist or we won't get the money. So something will exist. All right, so I did a presentation at one of the ELCs around exactly this, because actually I have a whole slide in that, I won't get into it. But there was two things that I, we always talked about. It was binary artifacts and ease of use. Um, so there was two things, uh, the way we defined um, Binary artifacts is uh, specific out for, uh, outputs from a defined build, meaning a open embedded defined SBOM tracked um, build that can be used or installed on a running target or to construct a target image is what we're talking about in this context. Um, how you optimize it, um, see if I can get my arm guy's attention. There we are. Uh, how you optimize it makes a difference when you're talking about binary outputs. And the ARM platforms have some unique challenges. I didn't say problem. Challenges. Um, how do you hit the sweet spot of a tuning that it, more, a lot of people can use on the most platforms, but still shows the platform in the way you want to show it, and then give them a path where, where they can do their own. But we have things like generic ARM64, which will be showing up to a layer near you soon with some generic kernel images that can boot on multiple boards. And that's a long ways to what we've had with x86 um, for ages. So when I first wrote these, none of that was, I added this in the last you know, week because it wasn't in here when I initially did this slide. Um, and the ease of use, as I say, it's sort of, it's easy and obvious how to complete your initial step, meaning how do I get an image on a board? Um, how would I boot it? How can I update it? And then if the next part of your ease of use journey is, man, I need to add a package to it or I need to add an editor to it because there's a config file I want to change, is there an obvious way how I would get Vim or Nano onto the target? And then continuing that ease of use training, like how would I rebuild the image? How would I rebuild some of it, right? So is there a well-documented and defined path between the different stages? And you'll see this is actually part of what is in the binary distribution prototype through the Sovereign Tech Fund is actually documenting uh, and making sure all the processes are documented. It's not just output of binaries. So this is a slide that I did for that ELC. So of course, the open embedded in the Octa project is how long it's, you know, binary artifacts have existed well, since day zero. Um, so there is a lot, there, there's a lot of different things that have come and gone, you know. Packages have been installed, generated, installed into the image whether you know it or not um, when it's packaging up in the back end and, and there, you know, we had build appliance. Um, we've had the build tools which, you know, SDK things to augment older hosts, the tool chains, BSB machine artifacts, all these things can go in, you can call them binary artifacts of a build. And of course they've been around. Uh, for ages. What's not been there is the sort of the design and the flow to support either reusing them, customizing them, or not doing all the work yourself again every time. And around the binary distro history, I sort of led up um, the five plan, the five year plan working group around binary distributions. We had a bunch of meetings. 
and inevitably there wasn't enough people available to do the work, so it kind of sat. And then now we have the latest where we're using some of the concepts for that in the in the latest thing. So Isla said, you know, you know, what about a reference binary feed for those that do not need to customize the base for standard packages? or for those that just want to sort of embrace and extend. Because um, there are a whole bunch of people that don't want to. Their first interface, they don't want to build from source with BitBig. I know, shocking as it is. Um, so this is the slide that we, we did as well. Um, and it's, I guess, maybe not super for this audience. But yeah, on this axis, it's like these are binaries. This is source. Something is harder. On that side, something's easier on this side. So if you're using source, of course, it's easier to do an SDK or an ESDK, license compliant, board support, customization, right? Um, but what about it's harder if you want to do an application, customer support, packages, or container builds. If you are doing it with source, it starts to move towards it's a little bit harder to do because a lot of the, I said in my last one, a lot of the common tools don't work, the instructions don't work, you're doing it from scratch, right? Um, you know, and it, but then if you move towards binaries, you know, universal packages, harder to do. What tuning are you going to do? Will it run on multiple platforms? Do you have, yeah, do you have fat binaries that have multiple different formats in it? And you can do it with containers too, right? What, do you, what lengths are you going to go to make sure they're universal, right? Customization, harder. Board support, again, harder. Everybody likes a magic binary blob from their vendor of choice. Um, you know, optimized packages. You know, harder but not as hard. And then over here on the on the side, right? If you want to, if you're doing binary, um, it's a little bit easier to do standard generic package applications, container building, customer support, right? So something I sort of drew up. It could be presented a bit better, but it's the point of this slide is depending on what you're most interested in in your project, it's probably easier to know if you're going to if source is the way to go, or you might be able to um, benefit. Uh, from a binary distribution and a reference feed. It is definitely not one size fits all. Sort of this is another one that we tried to do to illustrate the same concept. You know, if you're an IT or an application developer, well, you probably can't use a binary distribution because you don't care about the platform and the other one. You know, if you're up, if you need to do sort of partial customization, optimize certain parts, the system, keep it compatible. Depending on where you are in that yellow-ish square in the middle, you might be able to use a binary distribution. But if you are doing customized, optimized, or device-specific things, then it's not for you. And that's fine. You can do your own binary distribution, but it literally is just your own um, binary distribution at that point. Another thing, though, uh, when we talk binary distribution is it's more than just putting out a package feed, um, right? Um, reproducibility is important. Will those binary packages look the same when built in five years, 10 years, different hosts, whatever? It matters if you want to run a lot, if you want to be able to support it, if you have different ways to build it, it the reproducibility is important. So again, the licensing and the SBOM, just because you're giving somebody a binary package doesn't mean you don't need to also supply all the licensing and the all the information around it. Um, and there's multiple ways you can give it on, re I don't, we won't get into the interpretation of how you should ship licensing information with open source software, but there's multiple ways that as long as you have it that you can deliver it. it can always be there, not be there, be there on request, that sort of thing. Um, you know, if you're using binary packages, another thing that people don't think, will you get any support from the ecosystem? Because if you're using a binary package, um, from somebody's crazy set of layers and you jump on the IRC and say, hey, I'm using crazy board X with, you know, um, package Y. And I didn't build it. I just DD'd an image onto my um, SD card and I booted it and it doesn't work. You're probably not going to get a lot of support. But if you showed up and said, hey, I built this thing from Kirkston, blah, 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 this hash, blah, 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 this, and then you'll get help. So the question is, is, the, uh, is, you know, is there a way to get support um, from the broader ecosystem if you're using binary outputs and packages? And of course, can you support application and your system developers, or do you have to choose? So 
so and to, again, this is part of the level setting. Um, part of the binary distribution artifacts is you could say, actually, we could probably visualize this really good with that chains model, whatever you called it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are your inputs, right? The build configurations, the layers, your site and lo lo local configuration. Like, these are the inputs. And then the outputs are, you know, some of the binary artifacts, you know, some of them are internal, estate, all that stuff that we track, and some of them are user visible. People don't even know they're there half the time, right? So what we would consider an output of the binary distribution would be shared state, hash equivalency, PR service. You'll find out that one's sort of missing right now. Um, but it's important if you want somebody to be able to extend from the end of your binary, your package feed, and get ever incrementing package revisions so they can install their packages to supersede yours. Um, package feeds are an obvious output. Um, sort of your non OS components I mentioned before. And then pre built images can be, and I always have to put in a plug for OCI images and containers in every present. I'm contractually obliged to say containers every three slides. The use cases for a binary distribution are you know, to hide that learning and complexity curve until it's needed. That's a little bit of that on-ramp, ease of use, get people to you know, scare them away in the first two minutes of trying to do a build when they cloned BitBake and it yelled at them they didn't have the right host tools installed and they upgraded some and then they pulled it again and then it failed on the first package and it parsed for 10 minutes you know there's different things that will you know people will just give up so um, hide that and it can solve the problems you don't know you have until you know you have them and then you can dig into the details um, a lot of heterogeneous systems now that we're getting can take advantage of this whether you have firmware or MCUs or different bits you don't always get the source for some of those parts of those systems, or you don't, it's more that not even that you don't get the source, you don't need to rebuild their firmware until you know you need to rebuild the firmware. And so you can start with the binary and then have the ability to build the source when you need it. Um, in Microsoft, you know, to be able to blend the embedded and edge enterprise features, I was extolling the virtues of that during the break. Um, that, you know, it's more than just um, installing packages, you want to be able to do safe, secure. Containers, maybe you're delivering a bitstream, and for your FPGA, everybody should have an FPGA, um, uh, or different things, right? Low footprint runtimes, maintenance and service upgrades. There's all these things that you might, um, that are use cases for binary outputs. Um, and, the, you know, the base, say OE core, cannot provide them all, but it needs to be able to support this type of service built on top. All right, that's the level set. We all know what I mean when I say binary outputs, artifacts, and the reference distribution. The current effort, post five-year plan, post binary, I think there's still a zombie RC group for my um, efforts for the, the other binary reference distribution. But this made it into part of the Sovereign Tech Fund funding. This is all I got out of chat GPT when I asked it to send. He just sent me the image, so <laughs> yours did better. That's why I use Bard. Yeah, I used Bard. I got this, anyway, and a link. This is what we wrote in the RFQ. Um, I don't think I'll even, you can go look it up yourself. Um, just we believe that the overhead in maintaining such a reference binary feed has become more feasible over time, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so this word, oh, this, I'm not, the proposal. Use cases. This is, uh, Michael sent this out, right? These were the use cases that we're trying to cover with it. We have beginner, intermediate, advanced, which you can see sort of maps to, again, a little bit to those, my grid and the, the use cases that I had previously done. Um, you know, beginner, they want to fetch an image, ready to boot on a target machine, extending system by installing packages. Shocking, that's like table stakes for everybody else, but. Intermediate, tweak and rebuild existing packages, recompile new applications, modify your images through an SDK or other binary artifacts. And advanced, build it all yourself. Uh, and the architectures that it is supporting are x86-64 through QMU x86-64 and ARM64 through QMU ARM64. We are not targeting hardware as the initial targets of the, the prototype. 
but you will see here, I hope I put it in here, but part of the other output is documented steps on how you would propose and add another architecture or propose and add another supported board is an actual output. So whether we're, we're not doing it, but there needs to be a documented way to add to it in the future once we get past the first set of goalposts. So the distro that it's using is Pocky alt config. So that means you get systemd and glibc as the base images because we wanted to hit the widest amount of familiar services that people might know as part of these references. It's using sort of um, core image full command line as the rough first image uh, so you can do some on target development and we're going to do an SD card image. Example. It is IPK again documented if you want to use Deb's RPM. Just document how to do that. Um, public available our barn arcs will be via the CDN, as mentioned previously. So that would be the root file system image, image, the binary package feeds, the PR database. Again, this is the biggest technical chunk that still needs to be done and figured out. The PR database, well, maybe we'll trick Joshua into helping us make it work like hash equivalency, because it's similar. You need like a, you technically need a hierarchy of PR servers, but it needs to know about the hash equivalence data in order to work. You can't have one without the other, so there's some similar problems there that we need to solve that don't exist right now. So I think as we wrote it right now, it's just we say the PR database can be dumped and you can load it <laughs> and match it up to the hash equivalency data and that way you can go off the end. Um, and the other things, we're going to make the sources available from the images and the SPDX output um, as well as, of course, the build system and other layer sources are provided along with the binary reference. Uh, oh, there we go. The reference binary edition prototype will also drive the documentation of policies and process to address future work such as, there you go, the things I mentioned. So we're only going so far, but it will be documented for how we're going to do it in the future, whether it's, you know, buy a beer for somebody or propose it on the OE architecture list or, you know, do it yourself and send us the patches. Uh, I'm not actually sure what we've documented yet or if it's documented, but that will exist. Um, and the, we did, though, say we're going to document it, but then did a few policies that said you, criteria for adding any new CPU architectures or, or platform tuning is only the tunes that are in open embedded core. And I, I think John sent a whole bunch of new ARM ones so he can add more tunes for ARM like crazy. Um, and the criteria for testing non-OE um, core layers is that the layers must be Yocto project compatible and they should and the supported recipes within those layers should currently be and all their dependencies should already be tested on the auto builder. So we run chunks of meta open embedded and meta virtualization. Not all of it but different parts of them are already going through the auto builder infrastructure and so we said those are the ones we would start with as the, as the next set of packages to enable once we get core image full command line suitably working. Um, the testing was going to be producing and testing binary image through the auto builder um, and also testing that package updates work and dealing with any issues in the recipes uh, that arise from that. So within your current stable branch you should be able to go from one release to the next and from the latest to the tip basically and then between release branches from the latest update to our latest LTS and the latest update to the current stable. So there's a few, it's not any to any but that's a pretty broad set of updates. Uh, and, then, and then select the build and deployment of packages from the meta open embedded meta virtualization layers. We want to make sure it's container enabled from the, from the beginning. Again, I had to say that it's been three slides. The current status, everybody probably read and joined in the discussion, I'm sure, of the current proposal that's been sent and discussed. Uh, the process and testing have been designed and documented. Uh, the test infrastructure has been investigated and implementation started, so there's some auto builder configuration that's happened. Uh, the images have been looked at and the feeds, uh, Michael was asking a question just yesterday, I think, about them. Uh, the infrastructure changes are still pending, uh, so that in particular the PR hierarchy is the biggest thing that needs to get done before April. 
hash equivalence, API, S state interoperability, we can thank. Hey, I'm shouting you out there, Joshua. Don't do email now. Look, see. He was already doing it. We knew we were going to need it. And so it would have been on this list if it hadn't been done. So that's something that we're just leveraging. The future binary containers, ESDK, maybe some better ways to use locked S state. Some of the stuff that Alexander is proposed with is like build kits or something might fit into here. So you can take what we do and extend it more easily. And then more extended testing of nightly updates. And that is your binary reference distribution status update. We've been telling people for years that the Okta project is not a Linux distribution. How's that going to change when we have? Right that? now, it's not going to change because that's not a distribution. It's a binary reference <laughs> distribution. <laughs> There was much care spent in choosing the, the terminology and everything we wrote ever <laughs> to make sure we didn't cause any undo. Uh, and I think if you would have read the proposal we put in there, it's like, no, we don't want to use, we're not trying to replace any existing binary reference, dis ref binary distributions you might know out there, nor are we trying to reuse somebody's or recreate one. Yes, very carefully chosen, which I spared us um, from on the slides. As it's a reference distribution, we are sure it's never going to any production machine. So, um, so have you already chosen the CP, so the, um, uh, the, the name for the vulnerabilities that will be assigned to the, that distribution? Uh, Paul, <laughs> that's for Richard. <laughs> well, that's a good thing to ask. You should ask for that. Oh, uh, yes. You can ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I and, but unfortunately, if Ross gets his way, every time somebody who tries our ease of use on, on ramp through the reference binary distribution will get yelled at when they log in and tell them they'll tell them their vendor is bad, a bad person. Well, that, that's probably not a bad idea. That will help. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's basically uh, DNF. Basically, is what on the on target installer will be? Well, or whatever I, O package, ha IPK is, yeah. Because, I, I mean, don't we use DNF to wrap all of them? I don't know. Like, like I've cause, always cause just it's, used the it's like a meta on top of the individual Yeah, so whatever, ones, yeah, right? so it'll be that. Yeah. Yeah. Because the only wrinkle there would be someone might want at, but I don't think it's an OE core. But Yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and that's where we said we're already building the devs, but we're not testing them. But we will document how we're updating the other ones and then we, we could somebody can propose hey I think you should do a deb you know yeah. repository for it. I mean I think that works today but it uses DNF. Yeah. But and yeah so part which of it is different than you know, going Debian. through everything we know that works, making sure it works and then documenting as we go was one of the outputs of this. Gotcha. Cool. Um, so I proposed in another project uh, a few weeks ago to do pretty much that, uh, but for OpenBMC, uh, my requirements are a bit more crazy. I want the end user to have a base image that they can configure on their system before they flash it. So probably distribution. So I'm very interested in your guys' progress. Uh, where can I where can I find more? Um, right now, it's it's everything's been done on the on my oh, sorry on my past. I missed that <coughs> part. What was the question? Uh, I'm very interested in all your progress. Where oh, can yes. I like, find Yeah, more? it's all being reported on, I forget, Michael's sending. It's all on either the OE core or the Yocto mailing list. I could check which. I should have put links in here. I don't think I did. Let me check in. Oh, backup slides below here. What do you want? No, no, sorry, no. <laughs> um, no, um, I didn't do that. So, yes, everything's being done, of course, fully in, on, the, on the mailing lists. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, the, we send a report out in the... OE architecture is where the proposal went, and I just don't remember where he's sending the sort of status updates, whether it's to the Yocto mailing list or OE core, one of the two. Okay, I'll check. Uh, is there a deadline for that stuff? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's April. This all has to be. This April. This April. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, not long. Uh, there's a lot to do before that, not long. Not, not a five-year plan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, yeah, this is not five years out. This is three months, two months out now, so. All right.
Thank you.